Good afternoon, everyone. It's 12 o'clock, so we're going to get started. Welcome to our cardio webinar, Social Determinants of Health, Implementing Screening and Taking Action. I'm Dr. Michael Constant, the Principal Investigator of the Ohio Cardiovascular and Diabetes Health Collaborative, also known as Cardio, and I'm joined by Dr. Sherry Bolin, Co-Principal Investigator of Cardio. Founded in 2017, Cardio's mission is to improve cardiovascular and diabetes health outcomes and eliminate disparities in Ohio's Medicaid population. Cardio brings together Ohio's seven medical schools to identify, produce, and disseminate evidence-based cardiovascular and diabetes best practices to primary care teams. To learn more about the collaborative and to access our online repository of best practices, please visit our website, cardio.org. I would like to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, the Ohio Department of Medicaid, and our administrative partner, the Ohio Colleges of Medicine Government Resource Center. I would also like to recognize the partnership of Ohio's seven medical schools who contribute to make the Cardio Collaborative a success. Dr. Bolin will now provide some logistics regarding today's webinar. Thanks, Mike. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, some brief logistics. Um, it Please uh, put your name with your first and last name on Zoom for attendance purposes. If you're joining as a group, please use the chat feature to record names and emails of anybody that's with you. Um, we want you to submit questions, so feel free to do that using the Q&A feature to submit them at any point during the webinar, and we'll answer that at the end during the Q&A portion. And we will have a post-webinar evaluation survey so you can tell us more about what you like or what you'd like for improvements. We don't have any disclosures for this talk. And uh, if you want CME, just make sure you register. And when you register that you click this, that you are interested in claiming CME so that we send you the appropriate survey so you can claim your CME credit. If you haven't registered, the QR code here will take you to the registration. And with that, I will introduce uh, Dr. Amy Zach, who is a family medicine physician and vice chair of education at the Cleveland Clinic and faculty at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. And Dr. Zach serves as our head of education dissemination of cardio. And we're delighted to have her helping to introduce the speaker and moderate for us today. So uh, Amy, turn it over to you. Wonderful, thanks so much, Sherry. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce our webinar speaker. Uh, Dr. Rachel Gold is an epidemiologist and health services researcher um, who earned her MPH at Temple University and PhD in epidemiology from the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Gold's work focuses on using health information technology to improve the quality of care in public clinics and reduce health disparity. As well, she has worked on the implementation methods needed to support the adoption of these important health information technologies. Um, Dr. Gold has partnered with the Ocean Practice Research Network since 2005, now serving as the Director of Implementation uh, Science Programs. She also has an appointment at the Center for Health Research, where she's a senior investigator. Currently, Dr. Gold's initiatives include studying how to implement multifaceted quality improvement initiatives that target both cardiovascular disease and disparity of care. We are thrilled to have Dr. Gold join us today to share her vast experience in the areas of social determinants of health and the implementation of change. Thank you so much for having me, um, Dr. Zach. Just a quick, it's, I went to the University of Washington. Go Huskies. Okay. <laughs> Um, I don't think I've ever been to Wisconsin. Okay. Okay. Here we go. I'm gonna jump on in. My apologies. Not at all. It's totally fine. I can see how you do that. But I mean, I gotta, you know, I gotta take some, I gotta take the pride in the UW. Okay. Okay. Well, what we're gonna talk about today, the overall uh point of what I'm gonna try and cover today is the what are the barriers and facilitators to implementing social risk screening. Um uh, I, uh, um, what are the barriers of facilitators to making referrals to address social uh, determinants of health um, and, and just get, get provide some updates on the current evidence on strategies for decreasing the, the health impacts of social, of social risks. You'll notice that I used the term social determinants of health, social risks. Um, we, what really we like to talk about is that I think I'm going to get to this on the slide, but, um, yes, that social determinants of health 
are usually referred to as kind of the, the, the community or con con constructual factors that then drive it, and then adverse uh, social determinants drive individual level social risks. And if a patient wants um, to have that addressed, if that's if the social risk is a priority for them, um, then we call it a social need. So for example, if a community is a food desert, we'd call that an adverse social determinant of health. If a patient is food insecure, that's a social risk. And if they want it addressed, it's a social need. I will try to use those terms consistently the way I just described them, but I will see how that goes. Okay, so what are they? Why do they exist? How do they affect health? And what do we know about healthcare setting uh, interventions to address them? Well, folks probably know this, but I'm just just in case anyone here has uh, is not dialed into this yet. Um, what we talk about is that social determinants of health again are, are are the conditions in which people live and work. Adverse, as I said, social determinants of health or social risks. We covered this. They are individual level factors like financial, housing, food, and transportation and security, and um, also individual level factors like stress, social isolation, and exposure to racism. I sometimes think about these as which ones are driven by poverty and which are not. So financial, housing, food, and transportation and security are absolutely driven by poverty, stress to some extent, social isolation, and exposure to racism, not, not necessarily. Um, they can also mean, again, neighborhood factors like poor walkability, et cetera. Um, again, really important to under remember that, that really the, these are primarily just driven by poverty, not, not entirely, but primarily. And I think it's really important when we talk about um, social determinants of health to remind ourselves that we cause this. We as a nation cause this poverty. Um, we are um, the 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 reason we have poor people is because of national policy choices that get made. Um, you'll see here in this first figure that uh, the U.S. right here in the middle ha it ha spends the lowest proportion of our overall combined health care and, and social care spending on social care and the highest proportion of all these other um, industrialized countries on um, on health care. Um, we don't, but again, we don't spend money on social care. That's one reason why we then have people who don't have access to food or housing is because we don't support that. And where is that money going that we could be spending on it? Well, most of it goes to the military. Half Over half of our um, national budget goes to the military, and 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 that is why we have social determinants of health. So I just think it's really important to remember this is not like a virus that we couldn't control. This is something we absolutely control as a as a country. Okay, um, so how much do social determinants affect health? Um, there are you I'm sure you've all seen these statistics before, and sometimes they say you know it varies a little, but the gist of it is that ten to twenty percent of health outcomes are directly attributed to clinical care. They are also related, they, but it is estimated that that social determinants count for more than sixty percent, and you can sometimes see that statistic higher depending on how it's how, how it's attributed. Um, social determinants, while well, you see in this figure that that health and premature death are driven by behavioral patterns, um, social circumstances, environmental exposures, and healthcare, only thirty percent genetic predisposition, um, and they directly affect social determinants. Then directly affect. All, all of these except genetic predisposition, and in fact, I think probably trigger um, if there's a genetic predisposition to certain outcomes, the social structures are going to uh, add to that likelihood that that genetic um, component is, is manifested. Well, how do social risks affect health specifically? Well, they, they lead to folks having lower uh, access to affordable care higher exposure to risks, uh, health risks like stress, discrimination, unsafe jobs, poor health literacy, adverse child events, lower um, exposure, ability to engage in healthy behaviors. This is very, very important. Lower ability to act on care recommendations, very important to what I'm gonna get into. And just to know that these, inter these, these are uh, interactive and cumulative effects. So example I'm gonna focus on um, is chronic disease risk management. Um, Again, consider diabetes, heart disease, um, anything that a person who has lots, who has adequate resources is better positioned to manage. Um, we know that a lot of these chronic disease risk factors are manageable with clinical and behavioral interventions, medications, improved exercise, improved diet, like people can control a lot, ma the majority of folks with, with, these, with these conditions can control them if they're able to take these steps. But social risks make it hard to do. The, to, they, for example, if someone doesn't have affordable care, their disease risk might not be identified. It might not be monitored. If they are transportation insecure, don't have a, a, adequate transportation, makes it hard to attend visits, makes it hard to fill prescriptions. And that's really important. Um, 
if someone's got housing or food or financial security, it can just make it very hard to eat healthier foods, makes it hard to exercise. Other needs are going to be prioritized. Um, and it can, again, impede ability to even pay for the medications that could control, for example, your diabetes. So in sum, lower income leads to social risks. Social risks make it hard to adopt preventive behaviors and interventions, leads to unmanaged chronic disease and poor outcomes. It's pretty simple. Okay. So, and this is true even when folks receive high quality care. So I do a, all my research is focuses on community health centers or federally qualified health centers, public clinics, the safety, primary care safety net in our country. And we did a cross-sectional paper that's shown here where we said, okay, well, let's look at how much of this falls on the clinics. We, we looked at community health center patients who had diabetes and, 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 and housing, food, transportation, security. And we found that, that, that those with housing or transportation and security had, were no less likely than those who did not report these, and these are among folks who were screened, to be up to date on their diabetes care. They were up to date on care. So the clinics are doing everything that they can in the clinic, regardless of social risk. But even among those with up to date care, Food insecurity was associated with lower rates of controlled A1C, transportation insecurity with lower rates of controlled all A1C, blood pressure, LDLs, housing insecurity, no significant differences, which we thought was really interesting. Transportation, forgive the pun, was the biggest driver. And um, so I, I think this is really important because we're asking community clinics to make, you know, to make, come to, 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 to meet these care guidelines and metrics, but they are maybe doing everything they can and patients are not able to go home and follow care recommendations, then you, then, then the, that sort of limits what the clinic's able to do in clinic. So... A, 19, excuse me, a 2019 <laughs> report from the National Academies um, that I was a, on which I was a co-author um, came out and it talked about, well, how can we integrate social care into the delivery of health care? How can we ask clinics to more effectively address these negative impacts of social determinants on health? And, and the report talks about the five A's of social care integration, which I kind of love. Um, the first is awareness. Are, are the care teams aware are, at, at the clinical level? And at the community level, are the are community people where policymakers aware of how social risks are affecting individual patients or communities? And then we've got healthcare delivery system interventions, which are adjustment, which is also called social risk informed care. And that's adapting the care plan to make it more feasible for the patient with a social risk to follow the care plan. So an example might be if the patient um, is um, uh, had transportation insecurity, maybe their follow-up care could be via telehealth if they've got adequate internet access. Um, assistance is the next A, and that's, that is um, sometimes called social risk targeted care, and that is the healthcare setting making uh, intervent doing conducting interventions to try and help address the patient's social risk. Like, so if someone's food insecurity, you make a referral to a food bank. Um, the other two are more community focused, and I'm not going to talk on them today, but just so you know, they are alignment and advocacy. So awareness, let's start with awareness, because um, and, and I want to debunk a myth, or uh, maybe it's more wishful thinking, which is that I, I hear all the time from folks, so why don't we just look at community information? It's so hard to collect patient level information. Why don't we look at like neighborhood factors? Because that's all available, publicly available information to, to see if, if that can tell us which patients have social risks. Um, but it can't do it. Um, we have done a couple of papers where we show that community level data identifies individual patients with or without social risks only about half of the time. So it's like flipping a coin, not useful. Now, I want to be clear that you can use that community level data for alignment and advocacy, but you can't use it for understand, identifying a patient at the point of care and what they need, an individual patient. Um, it can, may still have some contextual utility, but it does not identify individuals with need. That's a really important because people really want to be able to use the community data that exists, but you can't use it for clinical decision making, at least not that we've seen. Okay. Oh. Awareness. Did I skip another one? Nope. So awareness then often means you have to screen patients for their social risks and social needs. So what, what do they want to be uh, uh, referred for? Um, there is a lot of variation in screening prevalence. Um, in OCHIN's national network, and I, I should have maybe started by talking about OCHIN. OCHIN is an, uh, uh, a um, nonprofit organization that provides a full range of um, uh, health information technology services to um, hundreds and hundreds of community health centers around the country on a single EHR. Um, system. And in our network of over 1,500 clinics, um, over two and a half million social risk screenings have been conducted since 2016, 
and 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 only 15% of but only 15% of patients have been screened. And those numbers are a little bit higher now. We are actually at 3 million and it's about 20%, but that's still not a universal process system of people getting screened for social risk. And there really is a ton of variability between clinics in terms of who who is screening. So some we got some clinics that are screening 80% of their patients and some that are screening none. It really varies. Um, prior findings in, in other studies have shown that as well. Lots of variation across different care settings and percent of clinics are doing or settings are doing any screening or are they just screening some patients? It's more ad hoc, like, oh, I should ask this one patient, but you don't necessarily know what's going on with individuals unless you ask them. So I will say, though, there is a huge national movement. Um, these rates are going up. There's a lot of incentive, uh, a lot of policies that are incentivizing folks to do the social risk screening and um, and make it required. <laughs> so it makes the, the need to understand how to do it a lot more more urgent. Uh, example is that the, the CMS uh, as of 2024 mandates inpatient screening for some social risks. So, OK, well, if it's mandated, then how do we do it? OK. Um, and and are these screening efforts equitable? This is a paper, another paper um, from my team that looked at, um, we looked pre-pandemic, right? Because you try and like not use pandemic data if you can't avoid it in these kind of analyses, pandemic year data. But we looked across a, um, over 600 uh, CHC clinics in 21 states. We saw that only 30% only of the health centers were doing any screening and about 11% of the patients were screened. And there was real vari variation in who was screening and who was reporting risks by race, ethnicity, and language. We were really interested in that in this paper. So Black Hispanic and Black non-Hispanic patients twice as likely to be screened than non-Hispanic white patients. Okay, that's not what you necessarily expect, but that is what we're seeing. Hispanic white patients, 28% less likely to be screened than non-Hispanic white patients. Hispanic Black patients, though, 87% less likely to report social risks. And there's a lot of interesting things that go on with that in terms of who's willing to report that they've got a risk and who does not, um, or and actually have the risks. And again, um, among patients who spoke a language other than English or Spanish, uh, Black Hispanic patients were 90% less likely to report social needs than the non-Hispanic white patients. So my point on this slide is there's a lot of variation, not only between clinics, but also between patients and clinics. Um, there are barriers to implementing this screening. As we talked about in the National Academies report, and um, we've had a whole chapter that focused on it, and many others since have reported this. I'm just going to list some of them um, because I didn't want to have too much text on the slide. But the barriers to implementing social screening include <laughs> we've got competing needs, competing initiatives. We've got other stuff we need to do. We don't have enough resources to do it, right? Just because people are required to do it even now doesn't mean they're being reimbursed for it adequately. Um, people are like, oh, I already know my patients' needs or they think they know, but maybe they don't know, make assumptions, it, you know, uh, uh, unintentionally. There is issue around staff buy-in and to, do we need to do this screening? Comfort with doing such screening? If there's why screen if I can't refer? This comes up all the time, right? The clinic staff are like, I don't want to ask my patient if they have enough food to eat. And they say, no, I'm like, okay, just check it off on a box. Like that feels terrible. That's a moral injury for the staff person. So how do you reconcile that? Uh, lack of clarity about roles. Again, another thing that comes up for in our studies over and over is this tension with staff between like, can, do, do we really want to screen people for this very personal and, and challenging stuff with like, a checklist? Like that doesn't feel, we want to have a conversation, but if you want to have a conversation, how do you document it in a way that you can extract the data? It's very tricky. Um, staff turnover versus needed training. Oh my gosh, that's an issue. Um, what's the right workflow? Do you screen on in, in person? Do you screen on a tablet? Do you text them? Like no one's really clear on what the right way to do this is. And it really is going to vary, I think, by clinic anyway. What works for a given one clinic doesn't work for another clinic. When are you going to screen? If you're going to do it on paper, who's going to enter the data? When is that data going to get entered? Who's going to do the follow-up? Which patients are you going to screen? Which risks are you going to screen for? Which screening tool are you going to use? There's lots of different screening tools out there. None of them are really any better than others, in my opinion. And like, how often do you screen? There's no clear guidelines on this. There's no clear evidence about the right way to do it. Like, so folks are just kind of making stuff up, which you can't blame them, right? There's no evidence. I got to just do it. How do you code for it, et cetera? And some EHRs don't have adequate tools for documenting the results. And there's just so much more. So there's lots of barriers to doing this. Um, we conducted a study uh, that we finished about a year ago called the Ascend study that was that said, well, how much support can we do we need to give community health centers to help them implement social risk screening? And I should note here that this study kind of spanned the pandemic. So some of the results have to be taken with that in mind. But what we did was we had 31 CHC sites. We, we, we randomized, it was a step wedge design. So we worked with five or six clinics at a time. And each the intervention was that the, each clinic got six months of technical assistance on how to use the EHR to do this, practice coaching to help them figure out 
an implementation process. We had a five-step implementation process. I'll just walk you through this one column. The first step is create a team at your clinic. The second is identify your screening goals. Third is create your plan or your workflow. The fourth is you train your staff. And the fifth is you roll out and then iteratively revise your plan. Like we were trying to just say, well, if we provide six months of support and a structured process and tailored support, which is really important, and a guide to how to do each of these steps and ongoing meetings with these clinic champions and peer-to-peer -peer learning and monthly feedback data. And we gave them in the end, uh, here's your so here's your social determinants plan summary, like it's your plan for the future. Here's where you're, you know, we, we left the clinics with a plan. Well, here's what we found. Social risk screening was 2.5 times higher, significantly higher during the intervention than the pre-intervention period. And I should note that 2.5 times higher of not a lot is still not a lot, right? Some of these clinics were starting at nothing or like 1%, and we got them up to a few percent. It's really not that impressive, but significantly different. But that impact was not sustained post-intervention, and there was no difference in referral rates. We did not any people making referrals to social services. So what are the implications here? Did the intervention not adequately address the barriers to sustained in, in, in implementation? You know, was six months not enough? I think the take-home from our study was that CHCs that are being asked to do social risk screening may struggle to do it without adequate support. Um, we saw that, and we were giving them as much support as we were able. Um, just a quick note, in terms of the, uh, the the main results of that study, there are these barriers, CHCs especially, but I think other settings as well, face barriers to implementing sustained social risk screening. They might need substantial support, but I will say that we made our implementation guide publicly available. Um, it's on it's shared through the SIREN network. If you're not familiar with SIREN, uh, the Social Intervention Risk Evaluation Network, be, make yourself a bit, uh, familiar if you're interested in social risk. They are an amazing resource. And um, uh, long story short, we do. You are welcome to download the implementation guide and use it yourselves. We would love for you to do that. Okay. Now there are some other other projects that have gone on nationally. If you're familiar with the Campbell Health Communities Project, this is run um, a CMS national project that sought that sought to get to um, um, to work with thirty different sites to say, well, we're going to give you some money to do to implement social risk screening. We're going to incentivize you to do that screening. They provide, and, and the long story short of what they learned in their implement about that and their awareness implementation, their screening process is that you need a culturally tailored approach. No kidding. It helps with patient engagement. No kidding. It's kind of obvious, but they proved it. Um, using that screening data to feed back to clinics, like, hey, you've screened 10% 10, 10 of your patients last week. That's great. Can you get up to 20? Like that is an improvement that can support improvement. And people like feedback data in some circumstances, not all, some. Um, it's helpful to have very a dedicated screener role. The person who is doing the screening clearly de designated, helpful to integrate the screening and existing workflows. Very important to talk about the impact of screening. So I talked before about the, the sort of moral moral injury of like, how can I screen someone for something that I can't refer them to? But one of the things that we recommend is like, it's okay to screen people for social risks if you can't refer them as long as you and they both know why you're doing it. So you might say to the patient, hey man, we're screening everybody to find out how often this is food insecurity is occurring in our clinic so that we can advocate for it. And then that's, I think that feels less bad for people. Maybe not totally, but a little better. Okay. Okay, so that's how. So first things first, you got to make sure you know what's going on with the patient. So that's the awareness. But what about assistance? What do you know about making social service referrals? This is really pretty complicated. Um, if anyone was trying to do it, it was probably nodding their head like, yes, it is. It is hard. Um, there is emerging evidence that both internal and external assistance referrals can modestly improve health outcomes. By internal referrals, I mean the clinic maybe is saying, oh, hey, I'm going to hook you up with a social worker, or I'm going to provide food directly to you, or an external assistance is like, hey, I'm going to help, I'm going to refer you to a, a, a outside uh, social service agency to try and address your needs. Laura Gottlieb et al. in the 2017 evidence review, which really was an important paper, found that assistance strategies were associated with improved, some, some improved outcomes, child health and health behaviors, adult physical health and quality of life, some adult health behaviors, some mental health, adult mental health outcomes. But a lot of studies found no significant health improvements associated with social risk, this, this social risk intervention, and we really, which really indicates clearly that we're not that good at doing it yet or not that good at doing it in a way that's really effective. And then Fan et al., a more recent uh, evidence review, basically found the same thing, mixed evidence on, on whether these sort of referrals affect health and healthcare costs and healthcare utilization. Um, so again, what do we know about assistance? There's an assumption, and again, Laura Gottlieb, who's a very important thinker in this space, um, uh, put put out a, a really important paper earlier this year that basically said, look, man, if we 
if we the, there's an assumption if we screen patients for social risks and refer them to social services and patients receive those services that will reduce their social risks and they'll be gone and then social change changes in social risks will lead to improved health but i don't know we don't know that that's really true there's no there's not strong evidence yet that that supports that um it, it, what evidence does support is that there's a much more complex pathway and one key point here is that navigation, which is providing the patient with some support in accessing social services, someone from the clinic team, again, maybe a social worker, can be a health worker, that might be really critical to making that you can't, rather than just giving someone a piece of paper, like, hey, here's a list of food banks, maybe you need to have someone who works with them to help them access it, because there are other, there are barriers to, for patients taking action on that. I want to just show you, this is from, oh, sorry, it's a little bit blurrier than I realized. Um, from This is from that Gottlieb 2024 paper, but this talks about these multiple pathways. And I think it's a really interesting um, way of thinking about it, right? There's, there's, you identify the unmet social risk, but then there's, you know, there's the social services connection pathway where you're collecting patients to services and that decreases risk. Well, may, maybe, maybe at least improved health, but maybe there's the emotional support pathway where you're connecting patients with a navigator and then they just feel more supported. They're like, someone's got my back and that could lead to improved health. There's the health services connections pathway, which is okay, well, we're at least connecting patients to outpatient services, then they're getting more care like that, right? This is, and then the last is the healthcare uh, tailored clinical plan, which is I'm going to talk about a bit, bit more in, in a moment, where we're like, hey, well, maybe we can adapt the care plan and make it more followable for the patient, maybe that. So this is, it's really a compl it's complicated. It's more complicated than just, oh, I, I gave you a referral to social services. There are barriers, really substantial barriers to implementing these assistance interventions, even to the extent that we know that they do work. First of all, patients who are offered these referrals don't always want them. They may be like, I already tried going to that agency. They were a jerk to me. Um, they may be fear of stigma or discrimination if, uh, about pursuing these referrals. Like, for example, some of the time periods we look at, at folks may have been like, well, I don't necessarily want to put my name on something because there's immigration concerns or folks who maybe in terms of who are, who are having their children screened for like food insecurity, maybe don't want to report that they're food insecure because they're afraid that child protective services will get involved. Like there's a lot of reasons where people might say, no, thanks. I don't want a referral. Our team found about 80% of, of community health center patients who reported the social risk declined referrals. And I and there's been real variety in that reported by, by others as well. And there's variation in who reported and who didn't by how many social risks they reported, um, domains, by domains, we mean social risk domains, gender, race, ethnicity, a lot of stuff, a lot of, it's a complex um, situation. And other researchers have found a lot of variety in, 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 in um, food insecurity, referral acceptance, and housing as well. So patients don't always want it. And other, there are other barriers in terms of like, are there resources available? Like, I I mean, I don't know about you guys, but in Portland where I live, there's not really great housing resources. So if someone says to you, I'm housing insecure. I'm like, what's the, the best you can do is kind of be like, okay, we're going to get you on a list <laughs> that you're going to have to wait three years. Like that may not, there may not be adequate resources to do those referrals, in which case you can screen all you want, but that's not going to lead to an effective referral. There may not be access, accessible resources, patients with mobility issues, transportation barriers, like just they may not be able to get to them, right? One thing that we and we know is, is, is a fact is that, again, for example, some of the transportation insecurity, maybe you, you can refer them to a food bank, but they can't get there. So then then what good is the food bank referral do? It just doesn't get, it doesn't add to, up to anything. And then again, there are these very substantial implementation barriers. Again, like who does the referrings? Like with the screening, who does it? When do they do it? Does the staff have time? Do you have a workflow in place for it? Like who? And how are you going to follow up? And do the staff know about community resources? And to have them know, they have to have an up-to-date list of social service agencies, which leads us to social service resource locators, which a lot of folks are real excited about. And I think they've got potential. These are web-based applications that are set up to help uh, maintain lists of social service agencies in a given community. And you, a lot of folks may have heard of 211, which is 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 one that, that can be useful in some communities, but there's real variety across communities and how, how, how well populated those, that information is. And there are real barriers to using the social service resource locators. They can be costly. They don't always work well. I have heard from so many different clinic staff well, yeah, like, but the social service agency that we usually refer people to isn't even on this social, isn't even on this resource locator. So I, I you know, how can I, I can't use it to make the referral? And from the so service agency's perspective, they're like, why am I going to even engage with this? Like, what, what is in it for me to be updating this? Like, I mean, maybe they, maybe they want to, maybe there's benefit, but maybe they just don't have the staff to do it. Maybe they're not, they're not set up to do it. 
Um, the low co the lower cost SSRLs, for example, if you're going to go to the two on one website, that means you have to click out of the EHR and it's not efficient and the user needs to know where it is. Um, and even the EHR based ones are are really not ideal. Um, they're just really not ideal yet. I am hoping there'll be another generation of them coming that will work better. And then we talk a lot about closing the loop, right? Which is the clinic made the referral to a patient to a you know, social service agency, and then found out that they made it there like you would with a, a with like a clinical referral, like, you know, but that is hard to do. Those, those um, CBO is community-based organization, like they may not have the capacity to follow up and say, yeah, the patient made it here. They may not have the technology. They may not have staff. Um, so clinics can't just use SSRLs because having these, you have to have relationships with these community organizations and understanding how to work with them effectively. And that takes a lot of effort to get to. Um, there's a lot more we can talk about in this space. It's a very complicated, um, a very complicated situation, but this is where we are right now in the field. I will say that we've got a couple of great resources uh, on how to implement assistance referrals. Um, Siren put one out uh, a few years ago um, uh, on just a way to look at these different community resource referral platforms. And we are right now pilot testing an implementation guide um, that we will make, that my team is, that will be available in, um, in uh, the fall. Uh, we're currently pilot testing it in a few different community health centers. So hopefully that'll be really useful to folks. And it just talks about the decisions that you're going to have to make and the considerations you're going to need to consider to, if you want to implement um, social risk referral making. Okay. So now we're getting to, and I think I'm getting close to the end of my slides. We'll see. Um, adjustment, which I talked about before, which is, can you can you change a patient's care plan to accommodate their, um, their social risks? And um, what adjustments look like? What What is that? What are we talking about? So examples are making sure the patient has a generic prescription there. They minimize how much they're paying for the prescription. That there's a, um, or maybe a poly pill, making sure they have that. Can you mail prescriptions to their home? Um, you know, if they don't have the ability to get to the pharmacy. If you do mail them to the home, though, you got to remember that not everyone lives in a neighborhood where having something mailed to your house means that package will be there in a few, after it's been delivered. So there's concerns about that as well. Um, if someone is transportation insecure, as I said before, maybe there's follow-up care on pacing visits and 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 telehealth. And you know, is there some way to min min mitigate that barrier? If the patient uh, doesn't have a, a place to refrigerate medications, you should try it. Can you avoid refrigerated medications? Um, if a patient is food insecure and they have diabetes, you, you might need to think about their insulin dosing because if they run out of food at the end of the month then they might need, um, because their food benefits ran out, you might need to modify how much insulin they're taking when they have less to eat, which is incredibly sad, but it's where we are. Um, there is new, a, a body of evidence emerging that there may be better clinical outcomes if you make adjustments, these adjustments. It's not a very rich body of evidence yet, but we do but we do have some evidence that, that this kind of adjustments only occur, occur in less than 25% uh, um, of the time in a lot of settings. That may be getting better, but I'll talk to you a little more about in a second. And then what, what my team got really interested in as well, okay, if we want to help improve the rates of adjustments, like how does that work? How do we present these data so that um, so that folks will make adjustments? It's not, it's, it's, it's like, there's no clear decision support tools around that. Um, but we were interested in whether we could create EHR-based tools to that effect. Um, Oh, okay. Just one more thing. I, I was wondering where this slide was. What do we know about adjustment, right? What do we know about how often it's happening? This is a study that my team did where we surveyed um, uh, providers at the point of care and said after, right after an encounter and said, well, how much did you, um, and this is focusing on primary care clinicians in the safety net. So the slide I showed you before was focused that 25% is 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 kind of in very varied settings. So it's not surprising that's a little bit higher in safety net settings. Um, and we had and 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 we found that the the, the survey respondents said yeah in about about a third of encounters that that the that their social risks that they were aware of um, influence care, and um and that they got that information though here we go right interesting mostly from the conversation with the patient about th that that maybe you know oh gosh you have transportation security let's think about this differently maybe from prior knowledge some from prior knowledge and then less than half from something that is documented in the EHR. Um, they were significantly more likely to influence care among male and non-English speaking patients and those who had discrete screening data in the EHR, which is interesting given what the respondents said about where they got the information. 
Okay, so we are in the middle right now of a trial called Cohere that I'm co-leading with Laura Gottlieb, a co-PI is on that. We believe it's the first trial to develop clinical decision support, CDS, to try and improve adjustments, um, in, uh, 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 the occurrence of adjustments. And we're going to assess the how providers like the tools, how they use the tools, and um, how it affects health outcomes if they are used. And again, we're studying this in OCHIN and our network of community health centers. Our goal is to, again, so so I, I don't know if I get into that in detail. Nope, let's talk about that for a minute more. We did a process. This is just interesting. We did first, we did a community engaged process where we worked with a, a 12 CH various staff from community health centers who um, helped us develop a, an initial set of tools and what would they include. They really wanted to focus on medication, affordability, and transportation. So that's what we focused on. And um and 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 we and we put the with the first set of tools that we developed we put in um um we put in order sets which is for those of you who are, you know if you're familiar with this in EHRs it's kind of a way to be like oh yeah here click here to this is something we commonly order and so it's all kind of summarized here and the what we found that was super interesting was and we said in the original set of tools we pilot tested like hey we suggest you do the following we suggest you do the following we suggest you do the following you know just for blah, blah, blah. well very clear feedback we got from the pilot sites was we are community health center staff we know how to do this do not insult us by telling us how to do our job and we were like okay we won't they said we would like you to help us document that we made these adjustments and so we changed the way we approach the tools uh, and for the trial portion of the study and we're now a couple months out from finishing data collection in the trial um but i'll tell you our initial uh, we revised the tools to have it be more like hey here's how to document what you've already done but i will tell you that what people are mostly using in this trial are the tools that say yeah, um, just reminder to do the screening, the awareness tools, and a tool that lets them um, expedite uh, putting appropriate Z codes for social risks in the in the EHR. But the tools are not, we don't, I mean, preliminary evidence does not make it look like they're much using the tools we provided them for documenting these adjustments. So we got a lot of ways, a lot of ways to go on this. Okay. So what do we still need to know? <laughs> we need still need to know a lot. We don't really understand the optimized pathways through which social risk screening and referrals impact health outcomes, as I showed you before with that figure. Um, we don't know which approaches for addressing social risks are the best or most effective for which patients. It's going to vary. What methods are most effective in CHCs, which is my personal interest. Um, what are the potential harms, harms of social risk screening? We talked a little bit about the moral injury to staff, but we, you know, and, and we found in generally when patients have been asked about their willingness to be screened, in many cases, they are comfortable with it, but in some cases they're not. So who, how do you know how to do that in a way that is not going to damage the patient provider relationship? Uh, again, on the other hand, we've had many, many, at least anecdotal uh, examples of it, of it improving the patient provider relationship because the patient was so um, felt we, we heard reported patients were very grateful to have someone asking, like, thank you for asking about how I'm doing in that way. So it's not, it's not straightforward. And how much impact can we, this comes back to my earlier slide, how much impact can we even expect this screening and referral making to have, given how poorly social services are, um, are funded? If we want patients to be able to go to social services to address their social risks, you need to have social services. And if we choose not to pay for them as a nation, then that there's sort of nowhere to go. So that is it. I think I'm right under 40 minutes or even less. And I, I'm happy because I know there's gonna be lots of rich discussion to be had here. Thank you so much, Dr. Gold. Um, we invite everybody to ask any questions that they do have in the QA function. If you could use that, please. Um, and we will share questions and answers. And um, we do have a couple questions. I know we're asked in the chat. We will move those over. Um, so, Dr. Zach, you're gonna you're gonna let me. I don't need to go look in the Q and A. No, gonna... I, I'll take care of it for you. So, the first question that we have is: Can you describe what you mean by a culturally tailored approach to assistance and also adjustment? Oof. Sure. Um, Sure. I mean, one example might be a very simplistic one, but if you are um, trying to do an assistance to an to an assistance um, referral for someone whose primary language is Spanish, like you need to make sure you're referring them to someplace where some where they have staff that speak Spanish. 
I mean, that's that's maybe a, a simple but 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 very important example of that. You don't want to send people into a place where they're going to feel uncomfortable. So how do you do that? How do you do that effectively? You might, for example, if you live in a highly segregated city, you might want to make, you know, check to make sure that you're not asking someone to go into a neighborhood they're not comfortable going into. Um, so th that's what I mean by in terms of assistance. And I don't know that I did talk about a culturally tailored adjustment. I'm not, I, I don't know. I'd have to think about that a little bit. I'm trying to, I would be curious to hear what you guys think, what might be a culturally tailored adjustment. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that that would be quite as relevant, but but it might be. I don't have an answer to that. Okay. Um, and then we have a question um, about um, which is kind of an interesting one. I'll just read it directly for you. Since behavioral patterns play a strong role in outcomes on chronic conditions, are the assessment screenings or studies taking into consideration where patients are along the motivational interviewing scale. How much is a member or patient personally responsible for their health? Or is that personal responsibility for their health being considered? That's a great question. I, I think it's both. I think it's, I mean, you have a couple pieces of that question, right? So I, I, here's how I, here's how I think about that. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, of course, individuals have to be responsible for like, I am going to try and get enough exercise. I'm going to try and eat healthy. But the point I'm really trying to make here is that if there are contextual barriers to patients doing that, if it's not safe to walk in your neighborhood, if there's, if you cannot afford healthy food, then how much can you ask a person to take personal responsibility against something that is a, a larger contextual barrier? I, I don't know that you can. So my my feeling on that would be like, let's remove those contextual barriers as much as we can. And then we can talk about willingness to change. But I don't know about you, but my take is that most people want to eat, be healthy, want to eat healthy, want to be a healthy person. If their neighborhood, if their life does not allow that, if there are barriers to it, if you're working two difficult jobs and you don't have time to exercise, like how, how are you going to then say that person, well, tisk tisk tisk, you're not... You're not being, uh, you know, you're not taking personal responsibility. I mean, you can't ask someone to take personal responsibility only or only to a very small extent if they're in a context where it's not feasible to do the things that we might call personal responsibility. Well, I think it's a really, you've got to think about all this stuff within context. Our lives occur in context, in social context. And it's not realistic, truly not realistic to ask people to be able to like break through. I mean, imagine a low income. I live in a very mixed income neighborhood here. I think about this all the time. How would you ask someone in my neighborhood where we have not great, we have okay access to, to healthy to healthy veggies, but I usually drive to a you know a supermarket where I can get you know more more variety and and I can afford the, the you know to to eat a lot of vegetables. Now, how are you going to ask someone who's making minimum wage, couple of jobs? just exhausted all the time, has a couple of kids that they're trying to just, you know, keep keep happy. How are you going to ask that person to like improve their eating behaviors? That that just seems like you're putting them in a, a no-win situation and then blaming the victim. I, I don't I don't accept that. Okay. Um, I did want to go back to our prior question and discussion around culturally tailored adjustment. Um, we have a suggestion here that says, you know, you could do this by taking into account the patient's cultural norms, for example, illness beliefs and how to manage them, uh, listening to them and incorporating those illness beliefs when it makes sense into their care. Okay. So you're saying that like part of the issue here is like, do patients even believe that they need to improve their health or like, I mean. Well, like I think. I, I would advocate that I think different interventions are seen in a different through different lenses, depending on the cultural background of the person that you're taking care of. Um, and so it would be potentially important to recommend adjustments or make adjustments within that context right. um, and see. understanding understanding I mean, where your patients con what your patient's context is, yeah, I think, would help sure. with that. I think what I would say about that is that's accurate but a little different than what I'm talking about here, right? So sure, you do wanna, I mean, so example might be, here's a good example. Example might be is someone 
do they, is somebody even comfortable doing a telehealth visit, right? Like I personally love telehealth, right? Like I'm like, great. I can just talk to my doctor from my desk. I don't have to slip over to the hospital. That's great. But, but if someone maybe is a, maybe an older person or a person for whom like, they're like, no, 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 no. The way this works is if I see my doctor, I'm in person. I see the doctor. I'm not comfortable with telehealth. Then that would be an example, maybe of a, of, of that kind of an adjust of, of a way to maybe that I think uh, uh, an issue that would make it so you couldn't like, you'd want to think about that if before saying like, well, let's just do your next visit via telehealth to, to address your transportation issues. I think that's kind of what you're getting at there. And then can you, uh, Dr. Sack, can you, I feel like I missed a part of that question. Can you, was that, oh, I guess the other part is this. I think when you're providing clinical care, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a PhD, not an MD, but like I work with a lot of doctors. When you're providing clinical care, I mean, of, of course you should be, that's, that's a whole nother layer right? To what I'm talking, then what I'm talking about a whole nother layer of like, Hey, does this patient even think like I should take a statin or like, you know, Oh yeah. Well, I mean, you know, great examples, blood pressure medications where people are like, I don't feel bad. And you're like, yeah, but your blood pressure is too high. You got to take meds or you're going to have a stroke. And they're kind of like, I don't feel, but I'm fine. I'm fine. Like that's, that's a whole nother layer of complexity. You got to get through that step. And then once they're like, okay, I'll take the blood pressure meds, then you got to make sure they can afford them. And that's the layer that I'm talking about. So I agree that's part of it, but it's kind of another part of a, of a complex uh, situation. We have another comment about cultural adaptation. And, and I, I'm going to, I for the for person who, asked, who uh, put this in there, I'm going to adjust it just a little bit to make it a little broader. But I think it's an interesting idea to think about. You spoke a little bit about you know, even despite screening, even despite adjustments, the success rate in addressing the social determinants of health in our community health centers has been challenged. Um, if we take cultural adaptation or context adaptation, for example, um, you know, health promotion or health screening at barbers um, among Black communities for to reach the male members of the communities sure. um as an example that we know has been successful a successful model yeah um would kind of thinking about the changing the context in which we're doing the screenings potentially change the outcome that is, that is such a great question i love that question um i think the answer is I don't think we know. I don't think anyone's looked at it. And the reason, not that I'm aware of, please let me know if you are aware folks, because we certainly know about folks who are doing stuff like blood pressure screening in barbershops, that, that kind of thing, beauty parlors, right? Like just being like, hey man, we got to make sure you know what your health status is. But the question of like screening for social risks, social needs in other settings, I that's a fascinating question. And I don't, I am not aware of much, of, of, of much evidence at, at all that's been looking at that. What I would tell you, I would guess, this is, just a guess is a barrier to that is that it is hard enough to have to implement this in clinics where they are being mandated to do it right it is it's a hard thing to do this is not a this is a people you know it feel people because we have this bonkers puritan culture that we live in people feel ashamed of being low income um even though in fact that income level is very, very much driven by economic context and and opportunities made available. And, and so it's really not easy to say to people, hey, by the way, are you, you know, or do you have enough to eat? Does your family have enough to eat? Um, I think the reason that it's been able to be implemented in healthcare settings is because we're very clear that there is an effect on health, right? I mean, I'll tell you my, I mean, my kind of cynical take on this is that the reason that healthcare settings started doing all of this and getting excited about, and to be fair, community health centers have always tried to address patient social risks, just hasn't always been systematic or documented, but that is part of their mission. But in other care settings, a lot of the reason that there's now this interest in this is again, we've got these quality metrics and people are like, wait a minute, why can't I get that, that, that they're reimbursed for hitting certain targets? And for a place, you know, some big HMO or whatever might be like, oh, I'm not hitting my targets for, why can't I get to my targets for, you know, blood pressure control? Like, oh, it's actually because it has nothing to do with the, the care I'm, I'm providing. It has to do with the social context of, of this patient. And because it affects their bottom line, now they're like, oh, we're going to screen for social risks and try and, and, try and mitigate it. I mean, I'm, that's a little bit of a extreme position, but, but I think some of that is definitely true. But um, but so I, I love the question about could we do that screening in other care set, in other settings, in other community settings. Um, 
I, I think maybe what may be more effective would be just like having the resource information there rather than asking barbers or beauty beauticians to be saying, are you getting enough to eat? But but maybe I'm wrong. I mean, that might be a, a, a really neat way to go with this. I'll tell you one thing I am particularly excited about as a way to solve some of these problems is the is is having community health workers from Atoras, uh, other folks who are community members who work for the clinic and trying to do health advocacy. That may be, we are testing right now, uh, we're, we're in a study right now to say like, well, maybe that's the best way to do this. And uh, and some others have shown this as well. Maybe maybe having community health workers where you're kind, and that's kind of a middle ground there, right? I mean, they're, they're, this is a person who's not a clinician, but they work for the clinic, but they're a community member, and maybe they're going to be a, a more effective way of, of having this conversation. But to, to, I, I think maybe a, a I hope I've answered that question accurately. It was a great question. And we had a, we just had a, um, somebody contribute that, um, as far as different contexts, that a group has used screening and closed loop referrals in uh, a recreation and park center with cardiovascular health great. program and have had great. some success. So thank you for, for I'd that. Like know, um, I'd like to know how much success, uh, if you're able, uh, because my take is that a lot of folks are doing, are having a little bit of impact with this, not a lot, but I'm, that's great. I mean, one, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Zach, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No worry. Um, we 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 have a number of questions about uh, assessment tools and screening. So I'm going to try and um, ask you if you could speak to um, particular assessment tools that have some brevity. I think there's some concerns around how long it takes to screen. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, the and also there was a couple questions around the whether the screening can include does or can include digital literacy. Mm -hmm. And also the accuracy around the screening. Oh, yeah, great question. Oh, great question. Um, this is a thank you for thank you for the soapbox you have offered me to stand on. Um, um, there are folks who claim that some of the social risk screening tools are validated. I question what that means personally. That is an editorial comment. I guess, but a scientifically informed one. I don't, I don't think anyone has done a study to say is one screening tool better than the other, more accurate than the other. I'm not sure. I, uh, with a little bit of an exception, that there are folks who who do some very nuanced work around how do you define uh, housing insecurity. Um, you know, within the different ways you can ask about housing insecurity to to get a little bit more precision in terms of what's going on, and maybe a little bit on food insecurity as as well. But I don't. My my advice to folks is find a tool, a screening tool that you're comfortable with, that like just feels like it's going to be comfortable for your clinic and your staff. There are really not one tool is better than the other. I will say that Prepare, which is a very um, popular and and well a lot much used tool, and is supposedly validated, which I mean, take what you will from that. Um, that that um, it is long. It's a long tool, and it takes a long time to screen. The Accountable Health Communities tool, which CMS developed, is a much shorter tool, and CMS may start requiring that people use that tool if they're getting um, federal money for providing care. And so this this some of this issue may just be resolved by that. I personally would not mind seeing that happen because I think the CMS tool is adequate and short. Um, the question about digital literacy is such an important one, right? We know that especially in community health centers, like, I mean, it's better now the pan since the pandemic, but we still have pretty low rates of patients having a portal, a patient portal account. Um, there's... Um, I, I, so on the one hand, yes, so important. Yes, I see someone put in the chat about the Gravity Project. Take a look, definitely take a look at the Gravity Project. They do amazing work, and that work is led by colleagues of mine who really who really know what they're doing. Um, and on the Siren website, I'm going to go back to the other point before. On the Siren website, there is um, a table where you can look and compare all of the screening tools that are out there. So that's a great resource to help you think about which one you want to use. Um, in terms of digital literacy, I think it's a really interesting question. A really important one. And on the one hand, I'm like, yeah, we should ask patients about that because it's going to affect whether they use their, you know, how they engage with any, you know, any tech based tools, especially if you want to get them, for example, use something like a home blood pressure monitor, blah, blah, blah. On the other hand, then you're adding another screening question, right? And then, if, and then it becomes a longer screening. So I think that's, I think it's important. And I suspect that people maybe are just like, oh, I got to just deal with the stuff that feels like it's the most pressing, which is the 
food housing and transportation and, and financial insecurity? That's a great okay. question. And I think yeah. it's important. Yeah. Thank you. Um, how much impact do you think the new Medicare codes for community health integration and principal illness navigation could have on social determinants of health? I think there's potential impact. I don't know how much. I, I I'm not going to answer that on a on a, 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 a as a, a, a as well a quantitative yeah. variable. But as a as a dichotomous variable, I'm going to say I think it's got potential impact. For one thing, we'll have better data on what's going on. The more when one of the problems in the field is that there's you know again as we talked about before, there's all these different screening tools. It's you know we just usually aggregate up if someone said oh yeah they tested they screen positive for food insecurity on any screening tool that's fine we'll call it food insecurity. But but I think the more that we have date now you know some kind of standardized data some kind of standardized reporting i think that's all got real potential to have a benefit but i want to rebring up a point i made before which was that well often that using the, those kind of standardized codes involves using a standardized screening project process and people again there's there are some barriers to using any of the standardized screeners because people in you know imagine being asked by your your rooming staff as you're sitting down like Okay, I'm just going to check this out. Do you have enough to eat? Do you have enough to play? You can't. I'm ha doing that like a checklist really is doesn't feel good for anybody. So that's a little, it's a little bit. Um, you know, I, I, there's always this implementation issue. But I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. Let me say that. I'm hoping. I hope that the more that we have some kind of standardized data, um, we would would get us to um, would get us to um, at least better data on what works. Yeah. What so as as healthcare providers, teams, all of the folks on this call, um, this this webinar, where do we focus um, to get the best outcome or change? What if you were to say take all the data that's out there and everything you've discussed, and where can we make a change if we focus on health screening or um, adjustments as healthcare providers? Yeah, or healthcare teams in the clinical setting. You know, uh, I know we often have folks with pharmacy, social worker, lots of, of members of the healthcare team who join us. Yeah, that's such a great question. I mean, I the answer I'm going to give you is simplistic and not necessarily evidence-based. It's more anecdotal, okay? But I think maybe one way, maybe that if you just want like kind of a very baseline approach, I think it just might be saying to the patient, are you going to have any challenges acting on the care plan that we could help you address? Um, that might be the, the the most straightforward, you know, okay, so we're asking, you know, we're going to be new prescription. Are you going to have any challenges? You're going to have any challenges? And again, that may, people may might, might not want to admit it. We hear that, you know, we know patients don't necessarily want to admit it, but I think that might be a very basic first step of like, are you going to have any challenges to doing this that we could help you with? And that could be, you that, be asking that. Yeah, yeah, and that's a wonderful way to do it in a way that doesn't imply anything, really. And I, I know there were some questions in the chat around patients feeling ashamed or insulted or yes, uh, all of those both. things. We've so, heard all of the above. All of we've the things. Well, we have so many wonderful questions that are still out there, and it is certainly a conversation we could probably have for another hour, but we do have to wrap up. I want to thank Dr. Gold and everybody for their involvement. Um, we will see what we can do to get these resources um, with the webinar resources posted, so um, some of the website links um, that we've talked about as well. Um, but thank you so much for, for joining us today. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you both to Dr. Gold and Dr. Zach for moderating. Um, thank you, uh, all of you, for joining. Just a brief um, wrap up on the next slide is, um, again, if you join late uh, and you want CME, make sure you registered and actually clicked that you want CME so you can get the survey. Um, you can go to the QR code or the URL to do that. Um, and then we do have some resources on our cardio.org website about health equity and social drivers of health. And so um, including, you know, screening tools and things of that nature. And we point to Siren as well. So I think if you have interest in any of that, you can go to our online resource library through the QR code or this link. And then we do, as I mentioned before, want to hear from you. We'll be sending a survey out to tell us what you liked and what things we can improve for future webinars. 
And the last, I think maybe the last slide um, is just uh, thank you all again for coming. If you want to sign up for our cardio update newsletter to see our monthly resources and our newsletter, um, please do so. You can go to that QR code or you can follow us on social media if you use any of these social media resources. So thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. And thank you again to Dr. Gold for joining with us today.